Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's panel discussion on managing cyber risks for businesses. I'm Gina Skibo, and I'll be the moderator for our webinar today. I'm a partner at Whitley LLP, um, and I'm also Whitley's Milwaukee market leader. I'd like to start by thanking you all for attending today's webinar and panel discussion. I think we can all agree that 2020 was an interesting year on many fronts. With all that's happened over the last 12 months, we found many businesses accelerated their technology advancements to adapt to new and ongoing challenges, which has been positive in many ways, but in turn may also increase exposure to a widening array of cyber threats. In the first part of our time together today, we're gonna to learn about common cybercrime schemes and preventative cybersecurity and banking measures that you can take today to proactively address threats and effectively respond to a potential incident. The second half of the program will be a panel discussion, so we look forward to addressing your questions. Please use the chat feature that Alexis mentioned to provide your questions to our panelists. We're gonna to try to answer as many of those as possible during the discussion portion of the webinar. Okay, let's move on to introducing our cybersecurity panelists for today. Um, first, we're joined by Tom Wojcinski, who like myself is also from Whitley. Whipley is a top 20 national CPA and consulting firm. Tom specializes in assisting organizations with reducing and managing technology risks while increasing confidentiality, availability, and integrity of their information assets. From Wintrust, one of the largest banking institutions in the US with 15 chartered community banks in Northern Illinois and Southern Wisconsin, we're joined by Lauren Hess. Lauren's a sales professional focused on banking technology and relationship management for middle market commercial and industrial businesses, commercial real estate firms, and nonprofits in Wisconsin. Thank you, Tom and Laura, for joining us today. Um, so, Tom, I'll hand it over to you to start the presentation. All right. Good afternoon. Um, happy to be here. I'm glad we can finally pull this off. We've been in discussions for a year on how to get this joint Wintrust Whipley event together. Um, it's taken us a while to just finally give up and say, hey, we're not gonna be able to do it in person. Let, let's do a virtual panel discussion. So thank you all for joining. Um, I'm gonna talk uh, first about what's going on in the cybersecurity landscape and, and how are cyber criminals getting cash out of organizations and there, there's a, a couple of things that, that are important to talk through and just level set on how this is happening from an attack standpoint once we get past those those the landscape of the attacks i'm going to get into the attack vectors so these are the ways uh, that uh, cyber criminals are are most commonly taking advantage of organizations in an attack that that's designed to get cash directly out of the organization Lastly, I'm gonna leave you with uh, six critical cybersecurity practices. I tried to get it down to five, but I couldn't do it. So there's six things that um, I'm arguing that are, I wanna have you take back to your organization. And if you're not doing those today, at least start a conversation about how should we be doing these and make sure you're more resistant to cybersecurity attack. So in terms of the threat landscape that's out there, um, there's a couple of statistics that are uh, sources that I, I pay attention to to understand how prevalent it is, it is a particular uh, threat or strain of cybercrime and, and what's really causing it. Um, and that's the Verizon Data Breach Investigations Report. That's the, the most comprehensive um, analysis that's done on an annual basis across industries to find out how uh, a confirmed cybersecurity breach happened within an organization. And when we look at, at the statistics from the, the past year, a couple of things really stand out, out for me. 86% of the attacks had a financial motive. Uh, so somebody is, is, is intent on getting cash out of an organization. Um, and it's perpetrated by external actors in 70% of the time. So you know, we, we used to think, oh, the insider threat is the biggest uh, thing to worry about. But clearly from a cyber crime standpoint, when we've got 70% of, of the attacks are being led by external actors. That old paradigm has shifted. And we know we need to think about, about people uh, attacking us from the public internet. 
55% of the, the time, those breaches involved an organized crime effort. So this is not the, the teenager in his parents' basement that's trying to figure out how he can, can hack. These are criminal enterprises that uh, develop commercial code that's designed to commit cyber crime, and they are, are using it in nefarious ways to separate you from your cash. One of the, the most concerning statistics that's out there is the average cost of a cybercrime event. There was a study from Accenture in 2019 that looked at the, the total cost, uh, and it's $13 million on average for a cybercrime event. And that, that includes, um, you know, if there was any cash loss as part of the, the event, but it's the, the remediation costs and the extra, the monitoring that's got to get done, any PR that needs to be Completed. So you look all in at the cost of cybercrime, and and thirteen million dollars is certainly a, a very concerning number on an average basis for how how damaging these events are. So let's look at the the key ways that or, that that cybercrime organizations or cyber criminals are are getting cash out of an organization. One of the most common ones that that we see is a, accounts payable fraud um, and so this is a, a cyber criminal is sending an email or a physical mail saying hey i'm your customer they're impersonating your customer or, i'm sorry one of your so they're impersonating your supplier and they're saying hey we've changed our our bank account information here's our new details um, and from now on send all your all your payments to this new account and it's candidly shocking how effective this is, how simple this scam is, and, and this doesn't even have a big technical fix for it. This is just people being uh, questioning and, and verifying that they should do this and not reacting to an email uh, saying change, change your, your payment information hundreds of thousands of dollars on, on average uh, for the investigations that I've been part of and, and the unfortunate circumstances of uh, companies being out paying. So they're making legitimate payments for valid invoices to illegitimate account, accounts uh, based on this, this faulty direction, uh, this nefarious uh, information. And they're out hundreds of dollars on average uh, that they've got to uh, still pay their legitimate vendor. This is a very damaging attack model that's out there. The other one that has been increasingly prevalent, and, and I'm sure everybody's heard about it, but it's it's underreported in industry how uh, how often this is happening. We're only really hearing about it in uh, public sector uh, cases where you know, state and local governments have to disclose that that it's been uh, that they've been affected by ransomware. Um, in private sectors uh, and closely held businesses, there's no obligation to report this, and and everybody's got an incentive to keep ransomware out of the the press um, and not disclose it. You know, the consequences of of having a cyber secure of a ransomware breach being disclosed can be pretty significant. One client that, that I've been working with, um, they had one of their suppliers hear that they possibly had a breach and they stopped shipments. Uh, so there was actually a ship in the middle of the ocean that just hung out and they weren't coming in to deliver because they were worried about uh, the extent of the breach. So there was some pretty damaging consequences aside from any cash loss uh, with a ransomware attack. But what's happening in ransomware, if you're, if you're unfamiliar with how this works, uh, a cyber criminal is getting this specially constructed malware, this bad software that's going to encrypt your, your information. They're getting it into your network, usually through an email or a fictitious instant message um, that they're, they're tricking a, a user into opening a file or going to a link that's going to push out infected software. Once that malware gets installed on a computer, the payload executes and it's gonna to look to propagate itself across the network. Where else can I go? What other file shares and servers can I get to? 
once that ransomware makes that that lap around the network and figure out figures out where it can go that payload then is going to encrypt the data lock you out of your ability to access your files and demand a ransom payment for the decryption key that time span from initial infection to encryption can be as little as four hours so there's not a whole lot of time to detect that this is happening within your environment and you've got to be really, really quick in your ability to, to detect it and eliminate it within your environment. Some malicious innovation on the ransomware where piece, um, we've seen ransoms are, are, have escalators in it. So we're going to say, now I'm going to, I'm going to ask for $100,000 worth of Bitcoin. Um, but if you pay me in, in 24 hours, I'll, I'll take 75. So there's a little deal for quick payment um the, the, then the the payment goes up and then in some cases they're going to say we're going to delete your key after 72 hours and you're never going to get your information back so they're they're really incentivizing you as the victim to pay sooner um and then lastly uh ransomware you, you we used to just look at it as oh people are denying your ability to access the data um we have seen strains of ransomware where the attackers now are exfiltrating your data. Um, so they'll show you, hey, we do have a copy of your data. Um, if you have EPHI, electronic protected health information in your environment, you now have to consider that ransomware as a reportable breach from a HIPAA security standpoint. So there, there could be potential regulatory impacts to a ransomware attack as well. It's nasty stuff. Let's go to the next slide here, please. Business email compromise is the, the third most common way that, that we're seeing uh, cyber criminals uh, defraud an organization and get cash uh, out, moved out of the organization. Um, business email compromise is um, the, where the cyber criminal is impersonating uh, a, a person of authority within the organization. Um, and they do this one of two ways. They're either going to create an account that looks similar. Um, so if your email address is at work.com, maybe they'll make it at w0rk.com. Uh, you know, something that's, that's gonna look close enough that if somebody's not really paying attention, they're going to see it and, and do whatever the email says because it's coming from somebody in a position of authority within the organization. The other more devious uh, type of business email compromise is when a cyber criminal can break into uh, the executive's email account. Um, and there, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about how you help prevent that. Um, but if that is possible, they're able to guess the password and get in. Now they can hang out inside somebody's inbox. They can look at the traffic that's going around. What are they talking about? Who are they interacting with? How do they interact? How do they, they write and they pick up the nuance of languages? So when they, they move in for the kill and they're gonna ask for um, a wire transfer, you know, they can make it seem like it really is coming from that person because it's worded and phrased the, the same way that the CFO might, might interact with, with employees within the organization. Um, you know, it, we typically see these for, for wire transfers. They were, were closing on uh, an acquisition and we need money wired to the escrow account or they were buying property to expand a facility. You know, we need money transferred, get this done. It's gotta be in by noon today. You know, there's always going to be some sense of urgency to it as well. Um, so those are the big dollar ones. We also see some nuisance ones where people are just trying to get a, a couple hundred, five, six hundred dollars worth of gift cards. Um, these still happen. You know, so go go uh, buy Amazon or Best Buy gift cards. Email me the numbers because I've, I've got to give them out at a trade show or a virtual conference on that. Um, you know still a nuisance uh, but certainly less damaging when it's just a gift card versus a couple hundred thousand dollars from a wire transfer standpoint the other angle that somebody can take on the business email compromise is if if i can compromise a supplier organization now i can start targeting um 
the uh, the organizations and send in these AP fraud attacks. So a lot of times the business email compromise at one organization leads to uh, AP fraud at another organization, and they're they're tied together that way. Um, a lot of times in those AP fraud uh, attacks, we see invoices, actual invoices be presented. And one of the ways they, they, they're they able to do that is they've compromised the email account. If those invoices are emailed out, you know, there's copies in the sent item, so they can just pull those right out of there and represent them and add credibility in, in that next step of the attack. So let's talk a little bit about what's allowing these to happen um, what, what makes these attacks possible within an organization the biggest one out there is social engineering and this is a non-technical means of taking advantage of human nature uh, and we're going to trick somebody into violating protocol or security procedures easiest way that that comes in is is with a targeted email you might hear it called spear phishing where it's specifically constructed, targeting one individual, getting them to do a specific action. A lot of times it's coupled with a pretext phone call. You know, I want to call to credentialize it and say this is coming. Wait for this email. You'll see it coming later this afternoon. You know, give it some more credibility so people are going to uh, respond to it. And, and impersonation physically. Um, you know, we'll do this from a penetration testing standpoint with, with our clients. Um, you know, we'll see if we can gain unauthorized access to the physical premises of the organization. And if we can do that, we can leave our hacking tools behind so we can come in later uh, to, to further the attack and, and act on our objectives. No matter the, the source or angle of social engineering, make no mistake, you as an individual are the target. The, the best hackers aren't hacking systems, they're hacking people. And it's way easier to get somebody to invite you in than figure out how to break in through a firewall usually. The other thing that's making these types of attacks possible is really poor authentication systems. And that's probably a polite way of saying um, people still have terrible passwords. And we have systems for the most part that are gonna allow people to continue to have uh, terrible passwords. From an attacker or cyber criminal standpoint, we, we have two tools that, that we can use. It's called a password spray or a credential stuff. Um, the, a password spray is we're going to use readily guessable passwords and, and we're going to, we're just going to spray those at your email server or, you know, at your web application and see if we can get in with these easily guessable passwords. And if you have just a single factor authentication system in place, a password spray is highly likely to yield some kind of foothold access to a, a cyber criminal uh, because there's so much research on password construction. Uh, it's pretty easy to guess what people's passwords are going to be. A credential stuff takes advantage of people reusing passwords from one account to another. So if that original source account gets compromised and those, those credentials, the username and password are disclosed, if that's the same username you're using for a work account someplace else, and it's the same password, well, the attacker's got all the information they need to get in. So if you're one of the people that reuse passwords from account to account, that's my personal call to action. Stop it today. You've got some homework to do this weekend and start changing your passwords and make it unique across all your accounts. When an attacker is looking at, at targeting authentication systems, we were going after systems that don't have multi-factor authentication in place. So we're going to look at VPN, that, that's how your virtual private network, and we're going to look at um, Office 365. Both of these are tools that we saw get rapid implementation uh, last spring when, when the pandemic first hit. Um, and security was an afterthought for a lot of organizations. Um, so we didn't see those get properly secured. So there's still a lot of single factor authentication systems that are out there. And if the passwords are weak, they're easy to guess, easy to crack. Um, you know, what you think of as a strong password might not really be strong according to today's standards. The, the box here on the right hand side, just a, an example of we did a, a penetration test 
where we did crack all the passwords, well, 70% of the passwords in the organization, so almost 5,500 of them, and they were longer than eight characters. Uh, number one password that we saw was password one, with a capital P and a one at the end. That met the definition of complexity in their environment, but there were over 100 accounts that had that same password. And, and the, the argument that I've always heard you know, from non-technical, non-cybersecurity people is, is decrypting is, it takes a lot of computing power and, and it takes a long time. That's true, it does take a lot of computing power, but the computing power for password cracking has just gotten so significantly faster than we've ever anticipated even a couple of years ago. We cracked over 50, almost 5,500 passwords in a little over six hours um, in, in this engagement. It doesn't take that long to really crack passwords once you have, have a copy of the, the um, encrypted version of it. So we've got some work to do to make our, our authentication system stronger. You combine the um, credential attacks and uh, weak passwords with weak detective controls. Most organizations don't have the ability to identify that they're under attack before it's too late. Um, it, well, some studies we've been paying attention to, average of 150 to 200 days uh, from initial compromise to detection. Um, you know, ransomware is distorting those numbers. You know, so if, you, if your initial compromise to ransom is four hours, you know you've been hacked and we still have a volume of data that says the average time is over 150 days. The, the data is, is being skewed um, by the, the denominator for the number of breaches. Um, so that, that ransomware is making that, that number you know, a, lot, a lot shorter. So what, what can you do about it? And, and these are the six things I said I wanted to leave you with so you could have a conversation within your organization about how you're handling these. First one is multi-factor authentication. You've got to have that on all remote access methods, VPN, email, web applications, any remote access tools uh, that you're using to get into your network has to be secured by multi-factor authentication. We've got to have stronger passwords uh, and allow our systems to handle a passphrase. We have to teach people what a passphrase is and how do you construct a good passphrase for a password. I think 24 characters for a password is very reasonable to do if you think about it from a passphrase standpoint, then it's gonna be a lot easier for people to remember. Real-time detection and response capabilities need to be more prevalent. There are tools out here, there are service providers that do this for you. Uh, we're one of them, happy to talk afterwards if anybody's got questions about it, but we need better detection capabilities to identify indicators of compromise in a more timely fashion. So you've got a shot at, at defending against it. Um, you know, things that, that we're looking at at a minimum are, uh, or I would expect people to be looking at are, um, you know, failed authentication attempts on remote access and email servers, looking at impossible travel rules to see if it's, you know, if there's a, a likely attempt from somebody without authorization trying to gain access to an executive email account. You gotta be able to look for that. You gotta be able to look for processes that seem like ransomware happening on a computer uh, so you can stop that process, quarantine that machine uh, very rapidly so it, it can't propagate and infect the network. I was talking with an organization very recently about this and, and they are recovering from a, a cybersecurity attack. Their cybersecurity insurance company is saying, if you're gonna continue coverage with us, you have to get this endpoint detection response capability on all of your computers and you have to have multi-factor authentication on your administrative accounts internally and all your external access points. So the insurance industry is starting to wake up to the importance of these tools as well, because the, the losses are mounting rapidly from a cybersecurity standpoint. Hardening systems and networks, this is gonna get really technical really quickly, so I'm, I'm not even gonna talk about what this stuff means, other than there are technical things that 
are turned on by default when you install uh, operating systems and networks, then you have to intentionally enable these higher level uh, security features. That's something that you should be working with your IT organization or your IT provider to make sure you're doing these hardening activities like enabling SMB signing or uh, installing the local administrator password solution. Local admin passwords and SMB signing are, are two things that they're, they're just real easy ways for attackers to abuse normal network behavior to uh, escalate privileges and gain unauthorized access. So there are ways to, to harden the system and make it more difficult for attackers. If you have sensitive data within your environment, uh, strongly encourage you to encrypt that information. Uh, if it's encrypted and somebody has it, it there's no value to anyone else uh, without that, that encrypted data. And I'll make a distinction here. The algorithms used to encrypt sensitive data are much stronger than the algorithms used to encrypt passwords. So my, my other argument about uh, how quickly we can decrypt passwords and break them, you know, the sensitive data algorithms are, are very different and much more uh, robust from a, a ability to withstand decryption. Last one on here, make sure you've got appropriate cybersecurity insurance coverage. Now that's critical. You know, we can do all we can all do our best to help resist an attack. We've got to be lucky. We we need to be right 100% of the time. The attackers need to get lucky once. Um, so we have to anticipate that bad things will happen um, and we've got to be able to have some protection against uh, a catastrophic event, you know, that that might slip by. So I'm gonna hand it over to Lauren. Lauren, thank you for joining us today. I can't wait to hear about the banking safeguards to help, help protect us all from the cyber crime that, that we're seeing out there. Yes, and thank you, Tom and Whipley. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I learned a few things though from you, Tom, so you might wanna turn your, turn your video back on. I think as a consumer, maybe I need to worry about my Netflix and Disney Plus passwords being the same. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's um, such a good point. Yeah. That password, you know, that password is really just so important and that you are, you know, doing it differently on your computers versus your phone using tokens and multi-factor authentication. So I'm going to get into a bunch of that here too. Um, but I also heard something that was very interesting that you said 55% of cybercrime um, involves organized crime. And we see a lot of organized crime at the bank from a branch level perspective. So we might have um, multiple people hitting multiple branches simultaneously trying to do check cashing. And so what our branches do and what our branch network um, communication method is, is if you see something, you send an email sort of to everyone so that if they have someone in front of them who's trying to cash the same type of check or maybe seems off or it's for the same company, um, that they're alerted. And so that's sort of our version of what we see from an organized crime perspective. Oh, yeah. Just a... Uh, uh a mass attack. Let's let's try to do a whole bunch. Mm -hmm. They can't catch all of it at the same time. Right, exactly. They're hoping that we aren't communicating immediately when something happens and that one of five of them may may get away with something. Ugh. So that Girls. and um, bank change notifications through supplier in impersonation. I'm going to expand on that. Um, during what I have to say here too. Um, but I do agree that it's probably the most damaging fraud scheme outside of um, ransomware. So we see a lot of supplier impersonation when we're talking to our customers about, you know, what is the type of fraud that you're seeing at the company level. And supplier impersonation is definitely the most damaging because you can have the money leave your account thinking it's um, you know a legitimate payment 
And then days later, weeks later, your supplier comes back and says, hey, I didn't get my payment. Well, now you're out that money and you still owe the bill. You still got to yeah. pay the bill. So you're, that's sort yeah, of like getting it's a, in two it's ways. A, yeah, it's a, it's a two for, for the, the company right. there. Then the bad way. But yeah, that's rampant in, in, in construction right now. Um, you know, I think, well, I'll let you get to your stuff and we can, we can talk about that later. We'll chat after. Great. Yeah. Well, thanks, Tom, and thanks, Whipley. Um, so I'm going to go off of a few of the slides that we have here, um, but mostly I want to make sure that we have time at the end to answer any of your questions. Um, as I said before, multi-factor authentication is one of the biggest ways that you can protect yourself and protect your employees and protect your business. So, um, you know, we are consumers running businesses. And I understand that we want everything to be like our iPhone. We want our face or our fingerprint to be able to log in to any of our apps, including our bank app. Um, but you know, that's, that's what's comfortable, but what's necessary is that you have several pieces of authentication methods to prove that you are who you are before getting online, before um, conducting a transaction, and that part's really important, and that's really the first step. So that's why it's the first thing I'm talking about today. Um, username and a PIN with a digital token. So we used to only have those key fobs, and now you can actually have an app on your phone. But we wanna make sure that there's at least three pieces of authentication that you're going through before you gain access to online banking. So even though it's not comfortable and it may seem like a nuisance, it is what's necessary to actually really protect your login and your passwords for, for the bank. Um, we always say that you should have at least two pieces of authentication to release payments. So that's going to be dual approval, um, using a token, but mostly making sure that you have two different people touching that transaction. And that can be on actually releasing the payment or making changes on a template within online banking. And that one I particularly like to share with my customers because I feel like it's something that we might not be thinking about right away, but it's where a lot of the changes occur is within the template. So to Tom's point earlier, if we have supplier impersonation um, and somebody actually goes in and changes the template to be the new bank routing account number and and all of that but the dollar amount is the same if you're not alerted that that change has occurred within the template by the time it gets to you as an approver most of what you're looking at is the dollar amount and the company name and that doubt that uh, routing number and account number uh, from what i hear is not looked at very often so that could have been changed and you haven't been alerted, now the payment is gone. The payment is out. You've approved it because it looks fine. But at the beginning of the transaction, it was actually changed within the template. So I just want to encourage everyone to talk with your bank or with us if you want to talk after. It's really important to make sure that you have dual controls on any changes in your templates and your accounting systems. And we'll get into that in a little bit here too. Um, Out-of-band authentication is called UBA, and um, that means that you're doing an email or a phone call, or you're doing an initiation with a token online, and then you receive a text back. So whatever method you're starting with, you're doing your authentication and your approval outside of that, so UBA, outside of that band of authentication. So that if you do have someone who steals your password and your usernames and IDs and gains access to online banking, for instance, they cannot also have your cell phone in hand and get the text back. So there's a lot of um, safeguards that you can do to, again, protect yourselves, protect your company, but also to protect your employees. Um, the overarching theme of the type of conversations that I have with, with my customers are, you know, it's our 
innate ability and our want and our desire to give good customer service and to work fast. But in working fast and giving good customer service, we could be opening up ourselves to being a victim of fraud and having additional risk because we're not double checking, triple checking, going to someone else, making sure that you raise that red flag when something doesn't seem right. And again, it's that desire to have good customer service for your vendors and for your clients. But all in all, it's about really protecting yourself and protecting the company that you work for. And that means, um, you know, double and triple checking. Dual administration, um, this is where you have more than one administrator in online banking and you cannot make a change without the other administrator opining on that. And again, that is really just to protect the users, protect the administrators. I see this a lot with our nonprofits because they have audits and they need to have a user setup report where you make sure you have segregations of duties in place. And dual administration is just another layer of that segregation of duties so that you can have administrators who make changes and then you have administrators that approve those changes. Gina, do you want to go to the next slide here? Thank you. Um, positive pay. So positive pay, I won't talk about too much because I think everyone in the room, in the virtual room, hopefully knows at least a little bit about positive pay. Um, but when you think about how can you protect your checks better, I want you to think about moving your payments towards ACH. Because really, with checks, you have your account number and routing number on the bottom of your check. Um, we've seen uh, business parks where the mail was stolen out of everyone's mailbox. And that happens. Um, not only are you looking at your people internally who's touching the check, but it goes to the post office and, you know, how many postmasters are touching that. And then it goes into uh, the recipient, their mailbox, and who at their company is opening their mail. Do they have multiple people opening their mail? And so by the time you think about it, you could have seven, eight, 12 people touching your check before it actually gets in your recipient's bank, where an ACH is one-to-one. -one. It is you initiating, approving, and then the recipient receiving it. So I really believe that in the future, the best way to protect your checks is first, think about how many of them you can move towards ACH. And then for the checks that remain, make sure that those accounts have positive pay. Make sure that there is payee name verification on positive pay. So you want to um, definitely double check with your bank. Payee name verification really came out, I probably five or six years ago. I've been at the bank for 10 years and I don't think that we had it for all of the years that I've been here. So let's put it that way. Um, so if you are a legacy client of the bank that you're at today, you may only have positive pay, which looks at the date, dollar amount, check number, but does not look at the payee name. I do see this a lot when we have new clients come over they think that they have payee name verification on their positive pay at their existing bank. And it ends up that they didn't. So we always put that on with any new client. It's really important. So I just want to encourage everybody that's on today to check with your bank and make sure that if you have positive pay, that you have that payee name verification as well. And then two sort of newer positive pay um, discussions that we've been having at the bank surrounds your specialty account. So this is gonna be a commercial real estate account, maybe your new PPP account, um, a payroll or collections account. And um, you know, there's really a, a ton of other types of specialty accounts that we can talk about, but you may only write one or two checks a month or a year actually. And perhaps you have accounts like a collection account where you don't write any checks at all. 
you may want to put on what's called a post no check status for the accounts that don't have any checks that they write or reverse positive pay, which is a way by which we can give you positive pay without you having to send us a file upload. So when you do positive pay, you do your check register, you upload that, and we cross-reference and make sure that everything matches. With reverse positive pay, we simply give you all of the, uh, an opportunity to look at every check that's clearing your account. And then you're able to say, okay, yeah, that one's good, that one looks weird, um, I've gotta call someone about this one. So it's a way to have positive pay, but without the upload. Really nice when talking about those specialty accounts. And um, protecting your ACH debit. So, you know, once you have your routing number and account number out into the world, um, you can be debited electronically without your say-so. And if you don't have ACH positive pay or a debit blocker um, in place, the bank we don't know who you do and don't do business with. So that debit is just going to, it's going to go through. But if you have ACH positive pay, you're able to tell the bank, and really you're just telling the computer, um, who is allowed, how much they're allowed to debit you for, and um, put that maximum threshold on it. That part's really important. If you wanted to do block all checks, all ACH, because it's a holding account or maybe it's a sweep account, you would be able to do a combination of the different types of positive pay services I just talked about. Okay, common transaction fraud. Um, like I talked about too with Tom earlier, you know, impersonation is probably the scariest uh, type of transaction fraud that we see. So this can be I, I described it earlier, but you send a legitimate wire and a legitimate ACH as an approver because you don't know that there's been a change in the system and you trust your AP clerk who input all of the data and kicked off the payment for you to approve. And in fact, what happened is that there was some sort of impersonation that happened at the front end of that transaction. It can be employee or HR fraud. We have seen that kind of as an uptick, um, probably around the time everybody was also seeing a lot of the unemployment fraud and everything that's been happening in the last year. But if an employee reaches out to HR and says, I have a new bank account, I'd like my direct deposit for my next payroll to go into this new account. And HR sends it to the AP, person and the AP person changes either your accounting system or the template within online banking, again, you as an approver at, you know, that top end level, if you don't have an alerting system in place or dual approvals at the time of change, by the time it gets to you, you could legitimately send an illegitimate payment out. And again, a lot of times, if you don't end up getting that back, you still have to pay your employee or you still have to pay that supplier. Um, and let's see, uh, if you can go to the next one for me, Gina. On the reverse side of it, if you actually receive an ACH or a wire that is illegitimate by, let's say, maybe you have a new customer. Um, and they want to pay you via ACH or wire, and they send you an overpayment. This kind of goes back to that idea of wanting to give the best customer service as possible. You want to work fast. You want to get them their money back. You want to send them what the difference was so that they keep buying from you. And um, unfortunately, what we're seeing is that before they understand the settlement guidelines, meaning, um, you know, our AP, AR, uh, CFO team, if they don't understand the return guidelines on ACH and wires, they could send a payment back to the fraudster and within 24 hours, the bank could be notified, oh, that was an NSF, 
pull the money back out of the account or, oh, that was, you know, a fraudulent um, wire and the originator was just caught and there was a fraud event at this other bank and the other bank actually catches it first. You've now, again, sent that payment out and the bank is taking the money out of your account because we've figured out that during the settlement of the transaction, there was fraud. So that's really the scariest part of this. And so I have a bunch of things in here, um, points to ponder. You know, do you have a written corporate policy on how to do this out of band authentication and make sure that the changes are legitimate and you know have multiple people touching that so i want to um, encourage you to do that and then also what we're going to talk about in a little bit here use your banking team i really like to feel like we're advisors and that you know if you want to get me on a phone call with a new payroll provider um, and you know make sure that they're talking to you about all of the right things and that you just need somebody in your corner you know, that's who we are at the bank, that we're, we're to be leaned on in that type of situation. And I know Tom feels the same way on his end with Whipley and with the, the cybersecurity team. So if you feel like something is wrong, raise your hand, email the bank, let us know and let us help you. And really treat us as your advisors because we're, we're on your team at the end of the day. We don't want you to have fraud. And so a lot of this is just educating you um, but we just want to make sure, too, that you understand you can lean on us as well. And so here, here it is. Keep your friends close and your bankers closer. Um, so who is your go-to team at the bank? Uh, I like to kind of say, you know, who is your calling tree? Who is the first person? Who is your second person? Who is your third person? because people go on vacation, um, people go on lunch. I had a title company the other day who called me because our um, commercial services professional was on lunch. And they said, we can't get a hold of her, where is she? And I'm like, people take lunch. <laughs> I can't tell you when you're gonna need something or when fraud might occur or when you have to get a wire out or get information urgently. Um, but when it happens, you need to know who to call. And so get with your banking team and your relationship team and say, who is my 911? Who do I call first? And if they're out, who's second? Who's third? Um, do I need to send an email? And who should I copy on that? I really believe that that's an important part of your emergency response um, in the event there is fraud. And I'll say this too, even if your email is um, hacked, and you were a part of a phishing scheme, let the bank know that too. Uh, we get emails sometimes that say, you know, it's everything is misspelled or it's spelled correctly, but then the email address is wrong. Um, I'm sure all of you have encountered that at one point or another as well. But if we know ahead of time, because you've picked up the phone and called us, um, you know, we can put that alert out to everybody and say, hey, um, Diane's email is hacked. Make sure we pay special attention. So make sure you lean on us and use us as your advisors. Um, and we'll, we'll help educate you too on the settlement guidelines. So like I said before, if there's a wire or an ACH that comes in and it's an overpayment, do not pay the fraud, the person back, even if it's legitimate. Lean on us. Let us know if you need help. And then finally, before I turn it back over to Gina, um, I know we have a lot of IT people on here, and this is really um, Treasury 2.0 from the banking perspective, and we are starting to talk a lot about um, SFTPs, how do you still manage dual control through an SFTP, because that, that um, lies outside of online banking. So it's not something the bank can force. It's something your IT team has to work through. And really, that's going to be the next step in um, automation and technology for customers, um, for businesses like yourself. 
And so the bank is ready and excited to, um, you know, start talking about automation and technology with you. But at the forefront of that, you have to, you have to think about security and make sure that there's dual controls in place. And that part we have to lean on, um, the business team and their tech team in order to make that happen. So Gina, do we, do we have any questions coming in? Thanks a lot, Lauren. Yeah, let me take a look at what we've got. Appreciate uh, both you and Tom. That was a lot of great information. So yeah, let's get to the questions. But a quick reminder to anybody that has questions that they haven't submitted yet. So just please use the chat feature to submit those questions and we'll get to as many of those as possible during the rest of our time. Um, Tom, I'm going to start with a question for you. Looks like perhaps from a Whitley client. Um, what is a zero day vulnerability? I saw Whitley sent an alert about that last week and I was unsure what that meant. Yeah, the zero day vulnerability is a flaw in software that nobody knew about until right now. That's day zero. Um, the alert that, that we sent out last week was a flaw in Microsoft's on-premises email management system called Exchange. Um, and there was it, this was a critical flaw in the software and they had discovered this. There was a nation state actor who had figured this flaw out and kept it quiet because they wanted to use it for themselves. Um, and so once, once the security research community figured out, oh, this is what's happening, Microsoft made these, uh, made, they made these critical patches, released them off cycle and said, hey, this is such a critical event, you need to apply these patches now and we can't wait till our normal Patch Tuesday event. So zero day just means it's something that's been undiscovered before. Um, and usually they're pretty bad when, when they're announced. Um, the, in the case of this, this exchange uh, vulnerability, it allowed an external attacker to take over uh, complete control of the Exchange server. Uh, so now they would own all the mailboxes and, and be able to move laterally to other servers inside of the, the uh, environment of the company. Uh, so they could take over the whole network if they, if they needed to. Thanks, Tom. That's really good information. Um, Okay, let's go to the next one here. Tom, how can my organization determine determine if it's vulnerable to a cyber attack? Yeah, um, great way to do that is to start with a penetration test um, and take a look and say, when we're gonna do a penetration test, we'll start and we'll identify all the vulnerabilities that exist on the network perimeter, uh, and then we'll see what we can exploit with those vulnerabilities to gain unauthorized access. It will typically include social engineering as part of that um, because the, the bad guys are going after after our employees too. So we should test that proactively too. And we wanna see if we can trick somebody into giving us their network credentials so that we can come back in through another, another avenue. Um, that penetration test and a, and a vulnerability assessment to, to proactively identify exploitable weaknesses in your environment is the best way to identify how and how extensively um, you're vulnerable to, to compromise. Okay, thanks for that, Tom. Another question, with the substantial increase in employees working from home either full or part-time, what should companies be doing to protect their systems when providing remote access to their employees or associates? Yeah, for, first thing, make sure you get that multi-factor authentication enabled. Um, that's going to go an awful long way to disrupting a, an attacker's path to, to gain access to your systems. That'd be the first thing I, I would take a look at. Um, there are other things, you know, depending on what tools uh, a company might have implemented in order to streamline some of that remote work. Um, there are 
There are other settings. I'll use Microsoft Teams uh, as an example. By default, Teams allows this thing called Open Federation. And that's a convenience feature that would allow um, Lauren and I to talk in the same instant message. You know, uh, Wintrust could federate to Wifley and we could have a conversation in the same channel and we'd be able to collaborate and work together. It seems like a great thing to do, right? Um, but if that open federation is abused, what, what an attacker can do is impersonate somebody from inside the company. And we'll set up a, a, a fake account um, and use pictures. And we'll find we'll find the the victim on LinkedIn. Uh, we'll so we'll take a picture. We've got their name. We've got their title. We'll set up a fake account that's going to look exactly like that person, and we'll be able to impersonate them and interact with the employees within that organization. So now if I was interacting with Lauren and I was Lauren's boss or even Lauren's boss's boss, you know, what kind of information could I get that I would be able to use to further an attack inside of, of an organization? Probably so I'd look a at, lot. At securing, Probably. <laughs> I'd look at securing uh, that, that kind of federation and make sure that that was disabled. Gotcha. That's good to know. Um, circling back, this one sounds like it relates to the last question that you answered. Should the vulnerability assessment precede the penetration test? Uh, it depends. Um, I've had um, I've had client organizations want to do the vulnerability assessment first, um, so they could have a chance to fix things proactively before we tried to break in. Um, that that certainly makes sense if it's a mature organization that's gone through vulnerability management processes before. I, I work with organizations all the time that want to do both at the same time um, and, and find out if they're as good as they think they are. Okay, thanks, Tom. Lauren, this looks like probably best for you. My company already uses positive pay services, but what else should we be doing? Um, I mean, we covered a, a ton of that today, so I would really say to focus on what are the different company initiatives that you have for this next year or the year after, and in the next 12 or 18 months, are you going to employ um, any automation or SFTPs and technology, and how do you get ready for that? So. Um, I think I mentioned it earlier, too, to just trying to move more towards ACH payments, but also, you know, really working and, and having a bond with your IT personnel and saying, you know, how do, we, how do we best protect ourselves against fraud in some of these technology advancements we want to do in the next year? So it's probably the first conversation you should have. Um, you know, following the webinar is really kind of getting those two groups together and, and start talking about what's coming up. Okay, thank you. Know, Lauren, I, I really like that, that ACH debit block that you talked about too. I think that's probably an underutilized feature. Um, yeah, I, I've done my share of uh, financial statement audit integration work from an IT standpoint. And yeah, I've always, always seen clients say, Oh, yeah, we've got positive pay, but that that's just for the check files. Yeah, we send the bank a copy of our check register so they know what they need to clear against. But the uh, you're right. Our routing number and account number have been disclosed to the world. All you know, all of our all of our suppliers might have that already, so they can auto auto debit us. Mm -hmm. Well, who who have they shared it with, either knowingly or unknowingly? And where's that number gone? And you know. It's kind of scary when you think about it. Like you could debit any of those accounts if that's not enabled from a protection at standpoint. Any, at any time. And then there's yeah. a 24 hour settlement guideline. So you have one day to tell the bank. And again, as consumers running businesses, um, we think, oh, the bank protects us. The, the, the bank's got our back. And sure, absolutely. But there's regulations. And there are things that we have no control over, like a return guideline. And so, yeah, putting the ACH positive pay on there 
And again, you know, making sure that if you have that list of debitors where you say, yes, these people can debit me, but up to a certain dollar amount, that's the enhanced control of ACH positive pay. Because then you can say, look, we energies can debit me up to $1,000, but anything over that, I want to be flagged. They might have fat fingered something. Something's wrong. Um, and so there's a control mechanism within that debit block system as well. And combined use of that is, is really smart. So we're, we're running out of time here, but I do want to get the last question in that just got submitted. Um, if there is AP fraud due to a supplier's email being hacked and new bank information sent, is the supplier liable at all since it was their email hacked? I don't, that one's tough um, because it's going, you're going to have to go into like the legalities of your, um, your contract with the supplier and then the different banks that might be involved. And so that one's probably too tough to be able to answer kind of off the cuff. Um, but I'll say that if you're sending out the payment and you hit approve and you're approving the payment there's a lot more on you than there's going to be on them thanks lauren okay that looks like the last question we had submitted and i think we are at time here um thank you everyone for attending thank you to lauren um, and tom for presenting i hope this has sparked some you know, great conversations and some proactive strategies to keep your business safe from cybercrime. Uh, after today's event, you will receive a follow-up email with us uh, or from us with a link. So please go ahead and um, complete the survey in that link and have a great afternoon.